Any questions, problems, anything? We're down to uh, 38 project reports plus plus the 24. I'm ignoring for the moment so I can get a feeling of accomplishment. Um, anything? Okay, um, we talked about this a little bit on Monday. Again, this is a standard set of um, thermodynamic tables. And again, the enthalpy part, which is the first column, um, was really sort of a chem one thing. Um, and we talked about Monday about how we could use that to determine the enthalpy change for a reaction. And again, that is essentially an, the, whoops, oh my goodness. I don't know why it lost its mind. Hang on. The um, again, enthalpy is just essentially a specific piece, specific type of energy. And ultimately, I'm either exothermic or endothermic because my system, which is my chemical reaction, is either going uphill or downhill in energy, and the rest of the universe compensates for that because, of course, conservation of energy still applies. All right. And as I mentioned, downhill is more stable. That's why balls roll downhill but don't roll uphill. All right. And we got as far as saying on Monday that the other piece of the puzzle is this thing called entropy, which is really the distribution of states of the system. All right. And again, we talked about it on Monday in terms of two molecules in a beaker. You know, more generically, right, you can think of it as freedom for the system. Um, I shy away from the most common um, sort of pop science version of it, that entropy is disorder, although it looks that way, right? And so, you know, if you think about water molecules right, in a gas phase versus a liquid phase, right? The defining characteristic of being an ideal gas is that you don't feel your neighbor's presence. Right. So there is greater freedom in the gas system relative to the liquid system, even if exactly the same number of water molecules in exactly the same space. Right. And so there's more entropy associated with being gas than a liquid. In fact, right, that is the reason why water evaporates, even though it is energetically unfavorable. Right, if you calculate the delta H for the vaporization, right, i.e. evaporation of water at room temperature, right, the delta H of vaporization is 44 kilojoules per mole, specifically plus 44 kilojoules per mole. Right. And so to go from a liquid to a gas requires putting energy in. We talked about this way back in week one in terms of phase changes. Right. That process should not happen energetically. It does happen entropically, right? And so the rest of my thermodynamic story is this thing called entropy, which again is most accurately defined in terms of the distribution of states. Right. Again, it sometimes gets referred to as disorder or randomness, but that's not really the point of it, right? It's better in some sense to think of entropy as freedom or options, right? If you want the always questionable everyday metaphor, 
right? If you were particularly OCD, right? And so you keep your room, right? In a very strict, always constant state where if I go in there, there's always a coffee cup in the upper right-hand corner of your desk, one inch from the top and one inch from the right-hand side. The laptop is always directly centered in the middle of your desk. Your socks are always arranged alphabetically by color in the drawer. Your clothes are always hung up, right? In alphabetical color order in your closet, your bed is always made, right? You only have in that case one state for your room, right? On the other hand, if you're more freedom loving, right? I could walk in there one day and the socks are hanging from the, the light post, right? Your laptop is under the bed. The coffee mug is broken in the corner. Your bed's unmade. If I go in on a different day, maybe the bed's made, the laptop's on the center, you know, the coffee cup is on the nightstand, et cetera, right? Having multiple states available can look like disorder because there's no preference for any one state. Right, which is why entropy always gets referred to in sort of shorthand as randomness or disorder. Right, but it's really not about being disorganized or disordered. Right, it's about striving for systems that have the most available states. And so it's more about freedom and choice then it really is about disorder or randomness, right? And the good news is, other than the fact that entropy represents something fundamentally different than enthalpy, it otherwise behaves very much like enthalpy. And like enthalpy, the biggest, most important thing about entropy is that it is a state function, right? Which means all of the usual tricks we use with enthalpy will also work with entropy. Right. Right. And so a couple quick sort of qualitative things before we do any quantitative calculation, right? Again, phase itself has an entropy consideration, right? Water as a liquid has more entropy than solids and steam as a gas has more entropy than liquid water, even if you have exactly the same number of molecules in exactly the same space, right? Because again, for a solid, you tend to be locked into position by your neighbors in some kind of matrix liquids are flowing but bumping into each other and so their behavior is restricted by their neighbors and gases again are fundamentally defined by their freedom from their neighbors and so there's a phase automatic phase difference in entropy the other thing worth noting about entropy is the mixture issue all right if i have one mole of particles Right. In one case, pure water, in another case, half water and half methanol, right? I have exactly the same number of particles, quite possibly in exactly the same size space, right? But the fact that I have two different molecules actually gives me more entropy because my arrangements are suddenly more, um, much more open. The always questionable everyday metaphor I always used was, and it worked better if we were all in the same room, but there's 248 seats in this room, all right? If we had 248 clones of me, I should have probably issued a trigger warning, take a moment, reflect on that, right? If I have 248 clones of me, right? If I come in every day, it's just me, 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 right? Every chair has a me in it right? You just give me one different person, right? 247 me's and one Kanye West, right? And all of a sudden, I have a whole lot more states for the room. It could be Kanye, me, 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 me. It could be me, Kanye, me, 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 right? 
And if you give me two Kanye's, then things really start to exponentially explode in terms of my options. It could be me, Kanye, Kanye, me, me, Kanye, me, Kanye, or me, Kanye, a hundred me's and then a Kanye, right? And so inherently having mixtures, right, always gives me more entropy. Right. And, you know, that really, in some sense, explains two everyday things you're familiar with, right? The phase issue is why water evaporates. It is enthalpically unfavorable, but the gas phase is entropically favorable. And so entropy drives evaporation, not energy. If it was all about energy, evaporation doesn't happen. Right. And the mixture issue is really, you know, it's the old ink drop, you know, in water experiment. If you put a drop of water in ink, it spreads out and mixes all on its own without even stirring. Right. And again, that's the tendency of my mixtures to have more entropy. Right. If you throw entropy in with energy, you get what really are the fundamental rules of thermodynamics, All right? Good old rule one is our old friend conservation of energy. That is by far the most important energy criteria. The second and third laws actually both apply to entropy, All right? The second law says that unlike the first law, there is no conservation of entropy, right? In fact, quite the contrary, the entropy for the universe is always increasing. Right. There's two ways really to sort of summarize the second law, one of them more depressing than the other. Right. The depressing one is entropic death. Right. The universe is headed for a state of maximum entropy. Right. Less depressing on a Wednesday morning. Right. This is really the finger of time. Right. Every now and then we allude to the fact that, you know, time's not reversible. Right. In fact, the reason time is not reversible is because entropy cannot decrease. Right. And so if I always need entropy to be increasing, if I try to reverse the process. Right. That has to be a case of entropy decreasing. And since that cannot happen, you cannot run time backwards. And so the second law of thermodynamics. Right, really explains why time moves in one direction. So it's really kind of far more potent and important than it looks from this simple statement that entropy is always increasing. Okay, and the other somewhat interesting thing about entropy, right, the third law actually defines an absolute zero for entropy. A perfect crystal at zero Kelvin has zero entropy, right? This is important in a couple ways, right? One, it really is a contrast with enthalpy. I sort of mentioned really quickly in passing on Monday, right, that it's hard to measure enthalpy, right? In fact, we don't ever. Right, in large measure because there is no zero enthalpy. At least there's no current definition of zero enthalpy. So, you know, if you'd like a Nobel Prize, come up with one, all right? And so that's why all of my enthalpies are measured as changes in enthalpy, all right? On the other hand, because entropy has a zero, Right. I can actually measure entropy absolutely. And in fact, if you look at my thermodynamic table, the thing to note, right, is my formation enthalpies, 
are delta H's. And that's why they're delta H's. This is not the total amount of enthalpy in a molecule because I have no way to calculate that because I don't know what zero enthalpy means, which is why I took my relative position for enthalpy to be relative to my standard elements at standard temperature and pressure. And so my enthalpies are relative to an arbitrary position of unknown enthalpy. Right. And so it doesn't completely restrict my ability to deal with enthalpy. It does kind of mean that I never know what the total amount of enthalpy in a system is. Right. On the other hand, I do for entropy, which is why you may also note there's no delta in front of the entropy term, right? These numbers for entropy actually mean something slightly but significantly different than the enthalpy numbers, right? Those are enthalpies of formation. They're actually the enthalpy of specific reactions to make those molecules. On the other hand, my entropy numbers, right, represent the total amount of entropy in those molecules at standard temperature and pressure, hence the superscript zero. Right. It's a subtle difference, but it's a significant difference. And that really goes back to the fact that I actually have a zero for entropy. Right. And you know, just to elaborate slightly more on that, of course, the zero Kelvin condition is no motion. Right, because if my molecules are moving around, inherently they automatically have multiple states they can occupy because wherever they are now, move them over slightly and you've got a new state. Whereas at zero Kelvin, they can't move, so they're locked into that one positional state. Right, and the perfect crystal, right, represents essentially, right, a crystal where every lattice position is identically occupied. So again, there's no disorder in the system. There's no option in the system because every molecule is identical and it's locked into place and not moving because of the zero Kelvin. An imperfect crystal would be one that say has an impurity in it. Right, because then that impurity could move around. It's me and Kanye again. All right. Or a dislocation is the other sort of imperfect crystal. So if there's a missing atom, this is me, 247 of me with 248 chairs. All right, but if every lattice position is occupied, identically by the same atoms, right? And nothing's moving at zero Kelvin. That is my zero point for entropy, right? And these numbers represent the total amount of entropy in those specific molecules. Again, at standard temperature and pressure because this entire table has superscript zeros, right? Which is representing most fundamentally my standard temperature and pressure. There is a third standard condition, which we will get to probably Friday, right? And so other than that slight difference, I can do exactly with entropy what I do with enthalpy, right? Which is to calculate the change in entropy for a reaction by now looking at the individual entropies of the products and the reactants. And so, you know, again, as always, cause sign matters. It's products minus reactants. Because my entropy is not relative, it's also worth noting explicitly, right? my elements now do not have zero entropy, right? We mentioned on Monday that the enthalpy of formation 
for elements is always zero because making an element out of an element isn't doing anything at all, right? But since my entropy is not relative to the elements, but absolute, right? If I go to my table, and that's where these numbers came from, my elements, hydrogen and oxygen, do in fact have entropy values that are non-zero. And if I do this, in this particular case, I get a delta S, which is negative for the reaction, All right? Much like enthalpy, the magnitude matters, but the sign itself is critically important because it tells me whether I'm going uphill or downhill in entropy, All right? And so since this is negative, much like with enthalpy, you could refer this as being exo, in this case, exoentropic, right? which means you're going downhill in entropy, entropy decreased. Right. Now, of course, I just said entropy never decreases. Right. But of course, the condition on that was for the universe. Right, in this case, the system, which is the reaction is going downhill in entropy, which means the rest of the universe went up 89 plus, right? Because the universe has to, as a whole, always be positive in terms of its change in entropy, right? But that doesn't mean the system which again is, you know, a little piece of the universe I've cordoned off for study, right? The system can do whatever it needs to do. The rest of the universe is gonna to have to make up the difference. Right. It's also worth pointing out just qualitatively, I could not have guessed at the 89, right? I knew, and you could have also, that the delta S was negative, right? Because if you look at the reaction, right, there's really two things telling me that the entropy is decreasing, right? The big one being, right, I only have one molecule on the product side, whereas I have two different ones on the reactant side. So if this reaction is occurring, I'm actually going from being a mixture of two different compounds to being a pure compound, right? And we mentioned earlier, right? Mixtures are inherently more entropic, right? Than pure substances. That's the me and Kanye metaphor. The other thing driving it is I actually am decreasing the number of particles, right? I have a total of three molecules over here. I only have two molecules over here. All right, so I've also not only got fewer flavors of molecules to arrange, I actually have fewer molecules to arrange. All right, and so I could have guessed sign wise, and I think one of the OWL homeworks basically asks you to do that. All right, I could have guessed at the sign Right, the 89 I would have had to calculate. There's no way for me to sort of eyeball the 89. And of course, in some sense, the third important piece of that is the units, 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 right? Please note, right, the units of entropy are essentially energy per temperature. That's K for Kelvins, right? And so entropy is related to energy, but it is not itself energy. All right. And again, ultimately my whole goal here, as I said, is thermodynamics is the thing. If I'm trying to figure out if something happens, right, first and foremost, right, thermodynamics tells me whether it will happen or not. That is really my primary thermodynamic goal. Right, it'll also tell me what's more or less stable. It also 
helps me decide between competing reactions. It's a decision maker, which is why I sometimes refer to it as being the God function, right? And so there's actually a preferred direction for both, both enthalpy and entropy, right? From an energy standpoint, an enthalpy standpoint, right? Downhill is better, right? And so, you know, a delta H that's negative, right? Because again, this is small number minus big number. is always going to be negative. All right. And so an exothermic reaction is preferable from the universe's standpoint. An endothermic reaction is not favored because it's essentially the same as a bowl, bowling ball choosing to spontaneously roll uphill all by itself. I used to say, you've never seen a ball roll uphill, but of course, TikTok, you can always run the video backwards, all right? In the case of entropy, right, because of this demand that the universe always have increasing entropy, right, the preferred direction is in fact the opposite. Right. I need, or I shouldn't say I need, I prefer, right, the direction where entropy is increasing because then the universe can accommodate it without doing anything. If I take a system like the one we just looked at where entropy is decreasing, the rest of the universe pays a price for that. It has to compensate for that small piece of the universe where it's decreasing. On the other hand, if the entropy of my reaction or any other system I want to study is actually increasing all by itself, the universe doesn't have to do anything. Right. And so I sometimes refer to this as being thumbs up and thumbs down, right? Ideally, the universe wants an exothermic reaction where the delta H is negative, right? And it wants an endoentropic system where the delta S is positive, right? And if my reaction does both of those things, right, it's two thumbs up from the universe and that reaction will happen, right? The term that is used here is spontaneous, right? Meaning it happens without you needing to force it. You can do non-spontaneous things, right? But that actually requires you to get in there and force the system to go some way it doesn't want to go, right? I mean, you can get a bowling ball to roll uphill, but you have to push it, right? Whereas it will spontaneously roll downhill. Right. And so my thermodynamically favorable enthalpic, right, well, specifically exoenthalpic and endoentropic system will spontaneously happen, right? That is an easy decision for the universe, right? On the other hand, if both of those things are going the wrong direction, that is also an easy choice for the universe, right? If my delta H is positive, right? I'm going uphill in energy, right? And my delta S is now negative, right? In which case I'm going, I'm decreasing entropy. I'm going downhill in entropy. Those are both unfavorable, right? And so that is, two thumbs down from the universe, all right? And so such reactions, or again, any system, it doesn't have to be strictly chemical, right? Such a system will not spontaneously happen, right? 
Of course, there's two other possibilities, right? If you think of it in terms of sine, right? This is a negative and a positive, right? This is a positive and a negative. Of course, they could both be positive and both be negative, which really corresponds to one of my thermodynamic variables being good, thumbs up, and one of my thermodynamic variables being bad, thumbs down. Right, in that case, it's not so obvious whether that system should be spontaneous or not. Right, it's gonna have to decide whether it cares more about what's happening with the enthalpy than it does about what's happening with the entropy. Right, we've already seen one case of this. Right, for my water evaporating, Right, the delta H was bad. It was endothermic, right? But the delta S was good. I went from being a liquid to a gas. In that particular case, clearly the universe decided that entropy wins. Right. On the other hand, it didn't have to. Right. And so the universe had to decide, right? Sometimes this situation is a yes, sometimes it's a no. If it's a yes, you would refer to that as being entropically driven, right? Meaning the enthalpy wasn't helping me at all, it was all about entropy. Whereas if this was a yes, right, you would refer to it as enthalpically driven on the other hand sometimes even if the entropy is good if the enthalpy is bad enough it's a big fat no from the universe right and so the balance between the two is really the god function right it's usually termed Gibbs free energy. Some of you stumbled across this in your project twos, right? But Delta G could just as easily be for God, right? Because this is the decision maker for the universe. It is the balance between enthalpy and entropy. It is also, and this will be more important on Friday, it is also, in fact, the equilibrium condition. If delta G is zero, then your reaction is at equilibrium or your system is at equilibrium. You've reached a point of balance, right? In terms of yay or nay, Right. If delta G is positive, the reaction is not spontaneous. And if delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. Right. We will talk at some point about the importance of the magnitude of delta G. Right. But again, there's a sign issue that has importance all its own. Right. The positive or negative for delta G tell me right away whether the reaction happens, right? Or as we term it, is spontaneous, right? Or the reaction will not happen, meaning it's not spontaneous. And good old delta G, bless it, is also a state function, because of course it is the combination of two state functions, right? And so I really have two ways I can calculate delta G, right? One is just to use the table, right? If you, where's my closest table? Whoops, went right past it, right? You'll notice the middle column is in fact delta G's of formation. 
Right. So that again is delta G. It's the change in Gibbs free energy right, relative to pure elements. All right. It's a delta, not an absolute, because again, of course, I don't know the, the absolute amount of enthalpy. So I can't know the absolute amount of Gibbs free energy. All right. But of course, the other important thing about this entire table is standard conditions. Right, I can use this table right. but technically that table is only good if I'm at standard conditions, meaning it must be 298 Kelvins and it must be one atmosphere of pressure. Right. And so my direct calculation of delta G from the table right, is really only good at that one pressure temperature point. Right. I could also calculate delta G from the delta H's and delta S's separately using my little Gibbs free energy expression, right? If I calculate the delta H for the reaction and I calculate the delta S for the reaction, I can calculate the delta G, right? I do this when the temperature is not 298 Kelvin because I do not trust, I cannot trust, right? The accuracy of those numbers if I'm not at 298 Kelvins, right? It's worth pointing out, if I do this anywhere but 298 Kelvins, it is fundamentally an approximation. Right, because not only is delta G in the table at standard conditions, right, so is my delta H and my S. And so all three of these columns are only 100% reliable if I'm at 298 Kelvins and one atmosphere of pressure. Right, there are more complicated ways I could calculate it Right. It all their pressures and temperatures, but for us, right, we'll do this mostly because I am at least partially compensating the temperature in the entropy term, but I'm still essentially using a delta H value that I'm now assuming is temperature independent, which in fact is not completely temperature independent. All right. And so, I think we have just enough time, right? If I want to calculate the Gibbs free energy for the following reaction at 298 Kelvin, well, I'm at standard temperature. I trust my table, right? And so I can calculate the delta G, whoops. Directly, from the delta G values in the table, because again, those are the Gibbs free energies of formation at 298 Kelvin, All right? And so again, this is two times the delta G of formation of ammonia because stoichiometry matters, technically minus, three times the delta G of formation of hydrogen plus the delta G of formation of nitrogen. Right. If I go to my table, you will notice that much like enthalpy, right, the delta Gs of formation for my elements are zero, right? So, you know, here's hydrogen gas. Right, because in the case of both delta H and delta G, they're both relative to pure elements, 
And so there's no cost to making an element out of an element. All right. And so the only one I need to care about is the ammonia. Please note phase matters, All right? Here's ammonia in the gas phase. Here's ammonia as aqueous. It was ammonia gas. All right. And so my Delta G is minus 16. So if I go back and plug those numbers in, Right, the delta G for that reaction at standard conditions right, is minus 32. Right. And so again, you know, the first thing I notice about that is the sign, right? Delta G is negative. So in fact, this reaction is spontaneous at room temperature. And so before I go and do the reaction and equilibrium and limiting reactant or whatever's going on, of course, the first really fundamental question for any new reaction is, does it happen at all, right? Thermodynamics tells me that reaction happens. Right. If it's any temperature but 298 Kelvin, I don't expect that number to apply. So if I want to do the same thing at 500 Kelvins, right? Frankly, I'm kind of sort of half screwed here, unless I actually have thermodynamic tables that somebody measured at 500 Kelvins, right? This is another one of those cases where if I really, really, really need to know this number, I probably have to measure it myself. Right, because any calculation I do of this number right, is likely to be flawed if somebody hasn't individually measured the numbers I need at that exact temperature and quite frankly pressure, since this is a gas phase reaction. Right, but I can get at least an approximation to it if I actually calculate the delta G, not directly from the delta G's of formation, because I know those are wrong, right? But I calculate it from the slightly less wrong <laughs> delta H's and delta S's, right? Again, I am fundamentally assuming that the enthalpy is not temperature dependent because I'm doing nothing to compensate the enthalpy whatsoever, right? And that is not strictly true, right? You kind of know it's not strictly true, right? If you think of it in terms of my good old evaporation reaction, I don't know if you remember, but the delta H of vaporization at the boiling point right, is 40.7. If you remember when we were doing such problems back in good old week one, right, we had two different delta H's of vaporization at standard temperature, 25 degrees C, and then at the boiling point, right? And the very fact that it's not the same at those two numbers, right, tells you that it's not strictly constant, right? But if I do this calculation, well, let's go back to this calculation, all right? But if I do this calculation using the numbers of 298 Kelvin, right? I'm at least hopefully in the ballpark, right? I'm essentially assuming delta H is independent of temperature because I'm kind of forced to use the standard enthalpy values and the standard entropy values, because that's all I have, unless somebody else or myself measures them, right? I'm kind of at least partially compensating the entropy for temperature, 
right? Although not completely, because the delta S itself could be slightly different. But I'm doing nothing about the delta H, right? And so I do know, in my heart of hearts, even as I do this, right, that this is really an approximation. And if I need an actual number that has multiple significant digits in it, I probably have to actually measure myself, right? But I'm gonna calculate the delta H of reaction. I'll skip a step just for space. I calculate the delta H from my tables. Right. And then I will calculate my delta S from my tables. And then combine them. in delta G. And so again, since my delta H's are enthalpies of formation for the elements in my reaction, hydrogen and nitrogen, they're zeros. The delta H of formation for gaseous ammonia was minus 46 kilojoules per mole, right? I want to do the same thing for delta S. And then, of course, I combine them here, but of course, always, always, always units, units, units. My delta H is in kilojoules. My entropy is in joules. So if I'm going to combine them, I need to be all in joules or all in kilojoules, right? It doesn't really matter which, right? But they are going to have to be the same.
I forget the exact number or something like six. I don't have it calculated here. Six point one five. All right. Notice positive. All right. And so we'll talk more about this on Friday. This reaction, which remember was spontaneous at room temperature, now will not happen at 500 Kelvin. It is not spontaneous. And so, you know, contrary to often, you know, your expectations, hotter is not always better. In this case, if you heat this up, you turn the reaction off. Happy Wednesday. Um, if you have questions or problems, I remain here for the next three minutes.